Okay, thank you for coming, everyone. To welcome to AI for Business. Uh, yeah. Next week, you you are going to uh, present your group project. Okay. So it's a progress report. <clears throat> and the beginning of next week, so. 11.25, I will start with a quiz, okay, so that everyone will come on time. <clears throat> so the quiz is only two um, simple problems, so you're supposed to uh, study based on classification only. Okay, so classification is, uh, the topic is only classification. Just including the SPM, the Wicca, and uh, today's class. <clears throat> okay, so today we will uh, discuss two things. Okay? One is uh, naive pace, second is SPM. Have you uh, learned uh, this technique before? My question to you. Have you learned uh, this technique, SPM and naive pace, before in other classes? Not yet, I think. Okay, okay. So let's discuss about it then. <clears throat> so you can follow from the uh, class, Google Classroom in the topic of classification. Okay. So if you, this is the Google Classroom classification, right? So there we have. Uh, Last week we discussed discriminant analysis, okay, and uh, today we discussed a naive pace and a factor support machine. Okay, if we can finish, we can continue with decision tree and your network, but uh, I'm not sure. <coughs> okay, at least these two. <coughs> so you can download this slide. <coughs> okay, so. If you read the slide, okay, so naive pace is usually used for uh, text classification. Okay, so for example, spam filter. Okay. So uh, in here, I give a review. In the slide, I give a review what is probability, what is conditional probability, okay, uh, what is pace rule, right? Prior probability, posterior probability. Uh, we have discussed this also during the LDA, so in that case, I can skip this part, right? <clears throat> so, so let's start with the slide 20, uh, 35, which is a naive pace classifier. Okay, so the name naive pace come from the Thomas Pace, who created the Pace rule, and this is indeed based on a Pace rule. Okay, so we said classifier. That means uh, this is a supervised learning. Do you remember what is the meaning of supervised learning? That means uh, we have uh, a pair of input and output, right, and then the output must be uh, categorical, either ordinal or nominal data type. Okay. So if supervised learning with output of numerical, meaning numerical means the uh, real value, okay, uh, interval or ratio type, then that is called regression. It's not called classification. classification. So we are dealing only with classification here. Okay. Uh, next. Okay. Suppose we have uh, this classification problem similar to the LDA, right? So you have candidates, you have grasshopper. Suppose you have these five instance, and now you have a new uh, insect that is unlabeled. Okay. Then the question of classification is 
Is this cutting it or grasshopper? Okay. Then what you will do is to measure the attribute. So this attribute is the variables that you can measure. For example, whether it has wing, okay, what is the antenna length or length and so on. Okay. Color and so on. So this attribute is sometimes we call variables, which sometimes we call features, they or characteristic, they are the same thing. Okay. Uh, in this example, we, we use only two uh, features. It is abdomen length and antenna length. Okay. The output will be the class, which is grasshopper or cutting. Right? So then we have a previously unseen instance with a certain antenna length and abdomen length. And then you're going to uh, find out or predict the class. Okay, that is the problem here. <clears throat> so if you plot them between the two variables, abdomen length and antenna length, so you will get this plot. Uh, last time in LDA, we tried to find a, a straight line, right? But in, in here, in naive case, we don't do that. Okay? So what we do is to find the distribution. Okay? So these are, if you have a more database of the same uh, grasshopper and cut it, it, so it's supposed to be something like this. Okay? So what happened is uh, in naive case, we try to create histogram. So for example, in antenna length, this is the histogram, right? So you see here, uh, histogram represent the frequency how often that value happen okay so the axis of the histogram here represent the antenna length okay so the vertical axis in this case okay the horizontal axis okay that is the frequency okay so if you notice uh, this kind of uh, dis distribution, okay? it's similar to normal distribution, right? So then we can approach, if you have a lot of data, so we can approach this as a normal distribution. Okay, so suppose you have a new data, okay, which antenna length is three. How are you going to classify this? Yeah, whether it is cutted or grasshopper. So the red in here means cutted the blue here represents the grasshopper. Right? Suppose you know the antenna length is three. Okay? This is a new insect. So then what you will do is you measure. Okay? You measure the probability. How do you measure the probability? Okay? So for that data, three, okay. what is in the red? Oh, three, the probability for the red is two, right? How about for the same data in the blue? Oh, that for the blue one, uh, the, the, the height is 10, okay? So then you will say uh, the probability of the antenna length three that it is grasshopper is 10 divided by 10 plus 2. Right? So you measure both sides, okay? and then you define. The same thing with cutted Okay, So the probability that it is cutted is that the length is, the antenna length is 3 is 2 divided by 10 plus 2. Okay? Of course, because the probability okay, of 0 0.8 is larger than 0 0.16, then you will say, oh, this uh, uh, this uh, classification of this uh, new insect is actually grasshopper. You see? This is much easier than uh, LDA, isn't it? Right? Yeah. You, yeah. So what is the drawback? Think about it. What is the drawback? What's the difference between LDA and naive base? That is the most important question there, right? Meaning, look, in LDA, you build the, you have the data, right? And then you build the model. 
in that case covariance matrix and then you inverse correct okay that's the assignment right that yesterday you submitted so uh, <clears throat> that is called eager learning what is eager learning they have the data they learn something yeah, like regression Joe. they learn something get the parameter okay and then when the new data come in you don't need to learn anymore you just use that parameter right to predict you don't need to learn you don't need to run the whole things but in knife base it's the other way around this is called lazy learning so if you are lazy you will say oh i'm a pro knife base okay so what is this lazy learning Lazy learning means it will not learn until the new data come in. Meaning the new, uh, the new instant come in. You see here, you have the new instant, which is the antenna length is three. Then you are able to compute the probability. If you don't know the antenna length is three, you don't know the probability. Then you cannot classify. There is no parameter. Can you see the difference? Again, now, for example, how about if my data is not three, but seven? Okay, so then, okay, your, your new data is seven, right? And then you check, oh, if it is seven, what is the probability that it is grasshopper? You measure, okay? For seven, in the blue, the height is three. In the seven, the the height for the red is nine, right? Then you will say, okay, the probability that uh, it is grasshopper given that the antenna length is seven is three divided by three plus nine. Okay, it is twenty five percent. Okay, cut it it is nine over uh, twelve in this case, yeah. So in that case, seventy five percent. So then you said, okay, this new uh, insect. Okay, uh, the probability, okay, the highest probability in this case is cutting it. Okay, then you will ask, oh, that is if we know the value is actually numbers, right? Then you set as normal distribution. How about if the value is not numbers, but string? Okay. Oh, here, this is example here, eh? This is five five. So they are equal. So you don't know the, the classification in this case. Yeah? So naive base okay, uh, is very easy, super easy. Okay, that's why it's called naive or idiot base, simple base. Okay, uh, there is very big assumption in naive base. Okay, this is the one that you need to know. Okay, in in doing any model. What you need to know is what is the assumption behind. What is the assumption of LDA? You still remember? You open again the slide of LDA. What is the assumption of LDA? It assumes multivariate normal, isn't it? And then what else? What is the assumption of uh, LDA? Just last week, you forget. Okay. Do you do you use uh, two covariance matrix or one covariance matrix in LDA? Hello. Can we be more interactive? So I want to know. Did you really make the assignment, or you just copy from each other? So what is the assumption of LDA? How many covariants did you make to classify in linear discriminant analysis? One, right? Only one, right? That is the big assumption there. If you have a 
for each class you have its covariant that is called QDA quadratic discriminant analysis okay if you join all these covariants into one that is called LDA that is a linear discriminant analysis okay now in naive base we have assumption of independent okay so here we want to find out the probability of previously unseen instant belong to its class simply by picking the most probable class okay so this is the base theorem or base rule right what we have is given the class what is the data and what is the prior probability of the class and prior probability of the data right what we want to know is given the data what is this class so so this is exactly this theorem okay now what we want is we want to find out right given this data a1 a2 a3 yeah, attribute right so we want to know what is the, the class how to get that okay to get that of course you compute uh, we need to know this value okay this is this is using base theorem you get this formula right so the problem is to get this value is very complicated okay so this value is very complicated right because it's joint uh, probability of a1 a2 a3 n until a n given the class okay so but if you assume this is the big assumption okay if you assume that all of these are independent okay physically independent then suddenly this is very simple just multiplication okay so just multiplication of a1 given c a2 given c and so on okay okay so let's take example here okay in this example you have 10 data 10 rows of data okay this is the class the last one is the class right the categorical data which is binary yes or no only okay and your data consists of again refund this is binary this is nominal marital status and then the taxable income is actually numeric okay so this is a numerical data so how are you going to do classification using naive base okay so first you check okay how many class of yes so you have 10 data how many yes in here can you count three three okay so then probability of yes is 3 over 10 isn't it easy okay probability of no is 7 over 10 okay the same thing uh in refund what is the probability of yes three over ten ah in marital status what is the probability of single four i think hmm? one two three four four over ten right forty percent right so now my question what is the probability that it is no the not evade okay given that this is not evade what is the probability that they are married what you will do 
You separate them. Huh? You separate them first, okay? You separate the no and yes, right? After that, you calculate how many that is actually married in no. Is it clear or not? So, very easy, right? You separate them first based on the class. Okay? After that, you can get the probability of its value. Okay? So, okay, let's practice. Okay? So, this is the data that you already have, right? You remember during the wake-up practice, we, we have uh, this table. Okay? Now, I want you to classify manually this one, okay? I want you to classify the new data here. Okay? The age is young, income is medium, student is yes, credit rating is fair. Using naive pace. How are you going to do? How are you going to do that? First, you separate the by computer yes and no. Okay? And then, you check, okay? What is the probability of yes okay, for young? What is the probability of no for young? Okay? And so on, okay? What is the probability of yes for medium income? Probability of no for medium income, and so on. Okay, so here. So this is the prior probability, right? And then what you will do is, because you know the prior probability, then you check based on the question, okay, based on the question. In this case, our uh, age is young, income is medium, student is yes, credit rating is fair. That is the one that you will put there. Okay. For each class, age is young, income medium, student yes, credit rating fair, then you check for each class. Right? So once you have this, what you will do, you multiply. Okay? So for class, what is the, the value? You check there. Okay, you multiply the value of the posterior in this case. Eh? Given the class, what is the X? Right? So you check here. Oops. Say, for example, for yes. Right? So you have uh, here. Eh? For yes, you have 0 0.22. This one is 0 0.44. Here you have 0 0.66. Here you have 0 0.66 again. Then you multiply all of this, right? So then you get this value. For no, the same thing. Okay? So you multiply. But remember, we, we need to compare. Okay? We need to multiply the posterior with the prior. Okay? So in that case, we have this. 0 0.44 multiplied by what? Multiply by this one, right? Yes, okay, 0 0.6. Then you get this value, okay? So then you compare the two of them, okay? Which one is the larger? Between the, the largest between the two, okay? So in this case, yes is larger, then the x belong to class yes. So, is it clear or not? Is it clear or not? Tell me, what did you learn? Sanen, you want to say something? Clear, sir. Hmm? What did you learn? First, we need to separate their classes. Their yes or no, they buy or no. No, and then we see there is the student yes or no plus mm -hmm. the perimeter before, mm -hmm. and then after we find it, we uh, times it all according to the perimeter we want. Mm -hmm. 
and then multiply again. Don't forget, multiply again with the prior. Okay. Okay. The prior means the class, the probability of each class. Okay. You don't just multiply for for the posterior, which is the for each attribute. You also multiply again the last one with the prior. Okay. So once you calculate that, and then you take the maximum probability. Okay. Very good. So once you have that finished, you can predict already. But you cannot predict unless you have the the new instance. That's why this is called lazy learning. Okay, unless there is an exam, you don't study. <laughs> so <laughs> right. So if there is no exam, no study. So this is lazy learning. Okay, knife base. Okay, LDA is different. It's diligent learning. Okay, so they study first before the exam. So the exam is very easy. <laughs> right. So this is different type of learning, okay? So let's practice again one more time, okay? Uh, LDA. Ah, how about if your your data is actually uh, continuous? Okay. So there are many ways to to do that. Okay. One is to discretize. For example, you you tell okay my value is actually numbers it is real number continuous value right so how do you do that okay. one way is to discretize okay you you put them into pin with the range okay. equal range that is one way okay second is you split okay you split uh, into two for example okay. In, make it into binary yeah. based on certain threshold that you want okay and the most often used is actually you assume certain probability distribution. Usually what we assume is normal distribution, right? So once you assume normal distribution, then it is easier. So for example here, the taxable income is actually number, right? So then you assume normal distribution. So you know this is the, the formula for normal distribution, okay? Then for its, uh, one pair of a comma c a is the attribute c is the class right in this case income and then the class so for example income 120 given that this is no what is the value how do you got that you get the mean for each class you get this variant for each class and then you put it into that formula you get the probability. Finish. You see or not? So the AI there is the, the value, for example, 120. Right? Say the mean is, for example, 110. So in this case, the, the variance is, for example, 2975. Then you just plug in into that formula. You get the probability. Finish. Okay. So as long as you can calculate the probability, okay, you can easily calculate naive days. Okay. Actually, you can calculate this using calculator. You not not even need to use uh, uh, computer, right? Okay. So the same problem here. Okay. Say you have a new unseen record, which is not in the data. Refund, no, my rate, but income is 120. So what do you think? What is the classification of this new data? Do you want to practice? So. So in that case, you you this is the data, the test record you have, right? Refund, no, merit, income, 120. Right? So what you will do? Okay, you will do is to check yeah, one by one, okay? So get the probability for each class. So 
This table on the left side is the probability for each class, okay, and for its value. Okay, so it's already computed here. Okay, for its value of the uh, data in the table. Right? And then what you will do? Then you just calculate, okay? So that the class is no given the x. X is that refund no merit income 120. So you put it in. Okay. So refund no class no multiply by merit class no multiply by probability of income 120 class no. So you just check from that table. So one uh, four over seven, right? Refund no class no. Where is that? Okay, this one, right? And then probability of merit plus no. Merit plus no. Again, this one. And then probability of 120 plus no. Okay, you you have this uh, sample mean and variance, so you can you can calculate that. So we already calculated that earlier, yeah. 0 0.072 so there you calculate you get this value okay for yes it's the same thing okay so you you just say refund no but class is yes okay uh, probably of merit class is yes probably income 120 class is yes so you multiply all of that you get zero probability right and then, of course, in this case, the, the result is plus equal no. Okay. So that means this new data set, we can predict this person with this characteristic okay, will not affect the tax. So, until here, you have question or not? Um, how do you calculate the probability of income again? Which, which one? Um, the income? The income you, yeah. you get from the normal distribution here. Oh, I see. Okay. You, you base it on the normal distribution. You know the formula anyway. All you need to get is for each class, you get the sample mean and the variance. Right? And then... Okay. The, the A is this one, 120. So until here, is it clear or not? Yes. Yes, super clear, yeah? Thank you. So, you can calculate, right? Manually, you can calculate. Super easy, yeah? Now, base is actually super easy. Oh, the same thing here. Uh, you also have this data, right? Mamal. Eh? Mamal 2, this one. Okay, I just got it from here, and then I give to you. You already computed this during the Weka. Uh, workshop last time remember the assignment okay now we have a new data okay what is this new data set Oops. okay there is a new animal that give birth but cannot fly live in water have no leg what is the class right so how is the class so you check, okay? So, so I will say A in here is the attribute, okay? And then M is mammal, N is non-mammal, right? So you check for give birth, okay? And mammal, give birth is non-mammal, okay? The same thing, uh, no fly mammal, no fly non-mammal. Live in water, mammal, and live in water, non-mammal. The same thing. No leg, mammal, and no leg, non-mammal. So you get, uh, you multiply all of that. You will kiss, uh, you get this uh, value. Okay, and then don't forget to multiply with the prior. Okay, this is the prior. How do you get the prior again? This P M is mean mammal. So you calculate how many mammal in that class? Seven, right? Seven out of twenty. How many non mammal in the class? In the in the table? Thirteen. Okay. So you multiply by that. Then you will say 
oh okay this new data set is actually predicted as mama so i hope with this you already know how to calculate uh, naive base you already calculate actually last time okay so at least you know how to interpret how to predict this is the most important part right using the software you can get the result oh i got 100 percent in in normal case you how many percent you get 70 probably or 90. Right. so okay what is the advantage and disadvantage of naive base okay so advantage it can handle both yeah quantitative and discrete data okay uh it's robust if you have noise noisy data you can isolate that okay it can also handle missing value uh, in terms of space and uh, computation is very fast super super fast right okay because all you need to do is just compute the probability okay the the problem what is the problem here the problem two Two, two problems arise from a naive piece. What is the conditional probability is zero, then I, everything becomes zero because you multiply, right? This is one problem. Okay. Second problem is because you independ you assume independent features. What if that features, they are not actually independent? Can you give example of not independent? Okay, so for example, you say, this is a bus, and then you said, uh, blue bus and red bus okay so they are not independent because the uh, blue bus and red bus is just the color of the bus okay so in terms of uh, efficiency they are very fast okay because you only need to do a lookup table right first you you calculate the probabilities for each values okay and then put that as a small database. Okay. Then you just look up for its value. Okay. Super, super easy. Okay. Uh, naive base is not sensitive to irrelevant features. So, for example, okay, you're trying to classify the person gender or sex based on several features, including the eye color. Okay. Of course, we know that eye color is completely irrelevant to the gender, right? So this is an example. Jessica, okay. So for example, we have uh, many features, okay? And we have the, the value, for example, uh, the probability of Jessica is male or female is actually a very small probability change in this case yeah? and if you multiply by that uh, this file oh, sorry this value here represent the probability so So this probability represent the I. This probability represent the other. Okay. For example, the wearing dress, yes or no. Okay. So, but because they are actually very close to each other, for example, just 9,000 divided by 10,000 and 9,001 divided by 10,000. Okay. So then the result is not really sensitive okay, to that irrelevant feature. So we have also characteristic that uh, naive base is actually creating uh, quadratic, yeah? quadratic decision boundary, something like this. If you look at the, the boundary, it mean uh, two, you will get not linear, but kind of quadratic. 
Okay. So earlier I said there is a problem if the probability is zero. Right? So this is how you calculate the probability initially. You see that? Yeah. Even the class, okay, and AI is the attribute, right? So this is the number, okay, of that entries divided by the number of inside that class, right? So this is the actual formula to compute probability, okay? So to overcome zero condition, say for example, NIC is zero, right? Or NC is actually zero. Okay. So how to do that? One approach is to use uh, Laplace approach. Okay. So we just add NIC here with plus one, and then the denominator you add with C. C is the number of class. Okay. Another technique is to uh, add with uh, M times P. What is M? M is the number of parameter. Okay. And then P is the prior probability. So this is just uh, several ways okay, to overcome the zero conditional probability. Yeah? So this is not really correct, but it overcome the weakness. Okay. So this is an example. Okay. Suppose uh, you have data set with one thousand tuples, okay, and the income equal low is zero. Okay. Income equal medium is nine hundred ninety. Income is high is ten. For example. So then we want to use a Laplacian correction. Remember the Laplacian correction is this one. So then we add one for each case. Okay? So in that case, the income low is one divided by 103. Right? Why 103? Because you have three classes. Low, medium, high. Okay? So income for medium is now become 991 divided by 103. Income for high now become 11 divided by 103. So this is the corrected version of the probability. Okay? Which is still close to the uncorrected one. Okay? But now we don't have zero. Okay? Why you want to overcome zero? Because if you multiply zero okay, with any numbers, that become zero. Right? So we, we don't want that to happen. Okay, so the same thing here if you want to use an M estimate. Okay, this is just an example of how are we going to use the M estimate. Okay, so with that, how about the conditional independent assumption? Okay, so in practice, the dependency exists among variables right okay for example uh, you talk about hospital okay in the patient there is a profile of AIDS family history and so on and then you have the symptom okay of the fever cough and then the, that disease and so on they are actually dependent to each other right so but this dependency is not model inside naive because we assume independence Right. So, if you want to remove that assumption, then we have another model that is called Bayesian belief model or Bayesian network. Okay. So, we, we are not discussing that here. But uh, at least you know that this assumption will lead, if you remove that assumption, it will lead to different models. It is more, more complicated and need more data. Okay. So, your assignment today is to classify the text okay? similar to the spam filter but uh, i want you to classify very easy okay uh, 
whether it is love letter or business letter. Okay? So, you can, you can use for any other uh, example, for your group project. For example, yeah? So, but at the same time, you see here, uh, first, what you will do, you will calculate the probability of each class. Okay? This class is love letter or business letter, right? And then you multiply by the product of okay, probability okay, for the for each word. Okay. Given the class, what is the probability for of each word? So what is the technique? Okay. Number one, because you are new in my face, what number one you sort, okay, based on the class, right? Okay. You you join everything and then separate based on the class. And then you separate per word and then count the word. Okay, and then you calculate the probability of per class, the probability of word given the class. Okay, so if the word does not exist, what you will do, you can use Laplacian. Okay, okay. you can estimate that nk plus 1 divided by n plus the total count. Yeah? The total number, uh, nk is the word position in the same class. Okay. And then n is the total number of word position, which is the same for both class, right? And then uh, this absolute of the total count is actual total count of the same class. Okay, so <clears throat> the letter is rather simple. It is just this is for practice only. Okay, letter one is just content of this uh, sentence. Hi sir, I love you. Okay, letter two consists of Dear sir, how are you? Okay, you know, uh, this is uh, two letters. Okay? And these are examples of uh, the data that you already have. Let's assume that you already have this data. Okay, whether it is casual or formal, for each word, you already have it. And then these are the count that you already have. Suppose you already have this. So the question is, can you calculate, okay, based on this table, can you calculate letter 1 and letter 2? What is the classification? Okay, you can use Excel. So you calculate, you separate, right? So this is the analysis, okay? So based on this table that you have, Okay, you put it into a separate table, you get the casual all, and then you get the formal all, and then you get the count, right? From the count, you can calculate the probability, right? And then, now for each letter, you get the, the word, right? and then you calculate the probability that this word is actually come from casual or formal, right? And then you multiply all of that and then you multiply by the prior. Huh? So once you calculate with the prior, you decide, okay, whether this is actually formal or casual. Do you want to practice this? Or you want me to give you this one as assignment? Tell me your decision. You want to practice this now or you want to do it as assignment? Maybe later, sir. Later. That means uh, I will give you this for assignment. Okay? Yeah. Okay. So, with that, we finished the... Uh, uh, Night pace. Okay. Um, next topic. Let's finish. What is the next topic? Oh, the next topic is SPM. Supervised learning.
Let me check what I have here in the... Okay. So you open the support vector machine. And the slide for support vector machine. I have a book okay on support vector machine so I'm selling them for I don't forget how much and then uh, there are several books that are very nice for SPM okay this is uh, the book by uh, the Sastri and Muller yeah? this is very very excellent book if you can find this book or you can propose to the library to have this book this is really excellent book okay so what is SPM? Okay, this is another technique. Have you learned about first before that? Have, have you ever learned about SPM? Have you ever learned about SPM? I, no? I wait wait. SPM. Uh it's a support. I think not. I think not. Not sure. This is not. Yeah. Okay. So if not, let's let's continue. So SPM is a supervised learning algorithm to classify okay, uh, both linear and nonlinear data based on maximizing margin between the support point. So we will discuss what is support point. Okay and a non-linear mapping to transform the original training data to higher dimension. So, uh, we have learned last time PCA, remember? In PCA, what you want to do? You have uh, data, you want to reduce the dimension, isn't it? Okay, so you, you reduce the dimension. For example, you have 100 data, you want to reduce it into three only that capture the maximum variance right maximum variation correct but in svm okay we reverse the thinking okay this is very important here okay instead of reduce the dimension you increase the dimension okay you actually increase the dimension so this is a new way of thinking okay by the russian yeah so historically, this is uh, a groundwork by Fabnik and Cortes, and of course, uh, uh, Cherfunenskis, okay? statistical learning theories in uh, 1960s. Okay? So it has been successfully applied to many, many applications. Uh, these are the example of application for SVM. Okay? including in physics, in uh, uh, detection in engine, text categorization, breast cancer, speech recognition, okay, including time series for, for the stock market. Okay, this is really, really very good uh, algorithm. Okay, so I will give you an uh, illustrative, illust uh, illustrative example. Okay, so suppose you have this data, okay, with two variables only, okay. So you have the, the square green and then the red, okay? Then you say, okay, find me the decision boundary that separate the data. Okay, if you say it like that, you are thinking about, oh, this is uh, similar to LDA, isn't it? I want to find the line, right? <clears throat> That's first, okay? So this is what we do, okay? But, okay, this is, this is one possible solution, right? Uh -huh. So, but this is also possible solution, isn't it? Huh? Why not, right? How about this one? Okay. So, you will see there are so many other possible solutions to find the line that separate the two data, isn't it? So, the question is, 
Which line is the best? Okay. I know this data is linearly separable, okay? meaning that you can separate with a line. But my question is, which line is the best? Right? So now, question to you. Which one is better, B1 or B2? The one in straight line red or the dashed line red? I think B2 is better. B2 is better. Why? Because um like the most outer of the square and the circle there is not that far from the line, right? So I mean the variances. No. <laughs> but uh, if B2 is better than B1, okay. That means if you have a data in here, for example, I will, I will draw. Huh? So if you have a data in here, what is your classification? Uh, circle. Circle. But okay. is it true circle? But uh, if we use P1, it will be squared. Exactly. So then what, what do you think? <laughs> Is it closer to uh, the square or closer to the circle there? Not sure. We need to take a look at the statistics here. Uh -huh. What is the statistic that you have? <laughs> uh -huh. Right. So, uh, question is actually how define better. So, how many of you agree that this is P1 and how many of you agree that this is P2? Okay, fourth, fourth. Raise your hand. B2. B2, why B2? Because I'm com more comfortable with B1, sir. Why like, B1? Yeah. Because the distance is more greater, so the... The possibility the of force is uh, lower, actually. Yeah, right? yeah. Uh -huh. So, P2, if you are closer to the data, actually, the possibility of misclassification is actually higher. Mm -hmm. Right? Yeah. So, right? So, actually, P1 should be better than P2. Why? That's the question, right? The question is, we need to define what is called margin. What is the margin? The distance. Okay. The distance between the closest point, okay, the closest point to that line. Right? So if you look look at this P2, the closest point is this one, right? This is the closest point, and this is the closest point, right? But if you look at the P1, this is the closest point, and this is the closest point, right? Okay. So then you calculate the distance, which is the margin. Okay? Which one is the uh, highest margin okay? between the uh, two closest points? Okay? Of course, what you will do is to find the line okay, to maximize that margin. Why? Again, because you don't want them to be too close so that uh, rationally, if they are too close, easily you can misclassify them right so that's the idea of spm okay the idea of spm okay another way of look at look at it is to find a what is called a convex hull <laughs> So, the closest point, that's, how do you get the closest point, right? The closest point is actually in the convex hull. Right? You know convex hull. If you have the data, then you enclose the whole data set. Okay? You enclose the whole data set, that is called convex hull. Okay? So, in this case, the, the closest is not actually point, okay? but uh, 
this is the actual distance okay between d and c in this case so uh, between d and c so you bisect okay d and c to get the closest between the two close uh, convex half rather than the point right so then you can get that line okay remember the equation of line is w uh, times x plus b that is the equation of a line okay so yeah and then you will say oh this three point that we just put there that is actually that that is the three points that define that line right so the three points or the, the point that define the, the line that maximize the margin are called support yeah? vector support okay? so that's that is what is we uh, what we have in here yeah so for example if you have a, a skinny margin okay they are more flexible okay but actually more complex yeah? right but if you have a yeah, thicker margin okay, it's less complex right. so the support vector okay what we call a support vector are the closest point to the separating hyperplane okay, this is the small margin and this is the large margin okay and these are the support vector yeah they are the the support vector are the point the closest yeah, to the to the margin up to here is okay clear or not what is support vector okay the name is come SVM is support vector machine, right? So this is a system, machine in here means the system to find the support vector. Okay, so what is hyperplane anyway? Right? When we say hyperplane, okay, is basically depend on the dimension. Okay. So if you have only one dimension, that means a point, okay, this is the uh, equation of a point okay. a point is a hyperplane okay in 2d something like this drawing in the right okay a line is called hyperplane okay. now in 3d a plane yeah, like this example in this drawing okay, a plane is actually a hyperplane in 4D, you cannot uh, draw anymore, right? Because our capability is only up to 3D, right? So if you have 4D or 5D, okay, the number of dimension you can put as many as possible, but how do you get the hyperplane? Okay, uh, this formula, if you look at this, look, in 1D, I have W1X1 plus p that is a definition of a point right in 2d i have a, a line so it is w1 x1 plus w2 x2 plus p so this is the definition of a line right so this one any plus this one plus p yeah? so equal zero right so in a plane you have x1 uh w1 x1 plus w2 x2 plus w3 x3 plus p equal zero that is the equation of a plane right so similarly in 4d you just increase the number of uh, wx there okay so that mean what that mean i can simplify this whole things here i don't care about the dimension anymore if I put that into a vector notation, right? What is the vector notation? W transpose multiplied by the X. Okay? Plus B, B is the scalar, right? So this is called linear kernel. What is this? This is exactly the same as all of this. Yeah? 
1D, 2D, 3D, and 4D, and it's up to D. <laughs> yeah. The dimension does not matter. As long as you put it into vector, into matrix, okay, the number of dimension follow on itself. Okay? Now, let's talk about you have two classes, and then clearly the data is linearly separable. Okay, suppose you have a training data T, okay, and uh, consists of XI okay, and YI. So this is a pair, right? What is the YI? YI is either negative one or positive one. So it's binary. Okay, and then the number of data is N. So okay, this is you have a training data, okay, and then now you want to find the linear classifier. What is that? The linear classifier is practically you get the kernel, okay. How do you get the linear classifier? You get the W, okay. okay. X is given, Y is given, what you want to find is W, W here, yeah. This is W transpose. So how do you get that W? Right? So if you can get that, then you can classify. Okay? So remember we assume that we can separate them. Eh? So for linearly separable uh, data set, T a while ago, okay, there exists a hyperplane that satisfies all the point T if, okay, here, you can put this, if y is positive, okay, you will have uh, this kernel to be positive also. Okay? If, this, if the y is negative, then this kernel is supposed to be negative also. So these two equations okay, can be put together into one equation. Why? Because this is plus and minus y. You see here, we deliberately change the, the value of y instead of 0 and 1, now become negative 1 and positive 1, so that we can put it into this compact form. Okay. So, now there are many, infinitely many solutions of this compact form, right? Okay. So, to make the solution unique, we need to normalize and then we rescale that so that the closest point to the hyperplane will satisfy that the length okay, the length is one that's the meaning of normalization here okay so that means now i want to get the formula of spm is something like this okay so this is important look at this drawing here Okay. We have linearly separable data, right? Then what you want to do? I want to find W. Okay, I want to find W so that this will become maximum, right? So in that case, okay, let's say this is vector x0 is a kind of origin here, and then W is a vector pointing to that direction okay and then from there i can calculate the margin size what is the margin size the margin size is d minus and d plus okay how do you get the d minus and d plus oh because i know w then i can calculate the uh, d plus and d minus which is one over the, the length right that length only. So because you have two, so two divided by uh, the length of W in that case. Okay? And we know okay, this uh, margin hyperplane is actually uh, this is positive one and this is uh, negative one and in the middle is actually zero. Okay? Now, Based on this one, 
Now you can calculate, okay, the D. Okay? You can calculate the D. D is actually what? 1 over W times that uh, multiplied at the kernel, right? So this is to compute the distance, okay? So if you know this is the, the equation to compute the distance, then at separating hyperplane, okay, at separating hyperplane, what will happen? This one is equal to zero, isn't it? Right? So, <coughs> so then you can calculate also that this is the margin size. So now, because of that normalization, okay, the distance to the uh, from separating hyperplane to any point now become this equation okay so then you can put it out okay and finally okay you get uh, this minimization function okay our goal is actually to maximize the margin with this 2 divided by the length of w okay this one is equivalent to minimizing this function with this the other way around right w square half of that so this is now become a quadratic equation subject to constraint of uh, this value and this is the one that you will use okay so if you have separable uh, Theta, okay. What you want to get? You want to get W and B, okay. How do you get that? You multiply W transpose times W, right? This is exactly uh, W transpose times W is actually the, the length square, okay. So now using this formula, you can actually solve this, okay, using Excel solver, isn't it? Huh? So if you know the optimization, then you can solve this using Excel solver. It's very easy. Okay. So once you get the parameter of hyperplane with this W and B, okay, then you can compute the margin score. Okay, similar to LTA, remember? Okay. So then classification is simply the sign of the the score. Okay. So you get the margin score okay if you know the w and and b okay and the new data set is x right so you multiply this okay and then you can get the the score you get the sign of the margin score okay then you can get the classification remember the classification is only binary yeah okay positive or negative but it can be Nonlinear. Hmm? It can be nonlinear. It can be nonlinear. No problem. Okay. So yeah, this is if you want to plot. I, I don't use this anyway. So so this is suppose for example this is your data and we know that it's separate separable. Okay. Then how are we going to do? Okay. This is what I'm doing. Okay. I. I input any value for W1, W2, and B. Say 111, for example. Right? So this is the data. Right? And then what I will do? Because I know, I already assume first, yeah? Um, for example, this is 1, this is 1, this is 1. Okay? And then I can calculate W1, X1. I can calculate W2, X2, right? And then I can calculate the constraint, right? You know what is the constraint? Uh, this one. You can calculate this one, right? This is the constraint. Okay? So, once you calculate the constraint, you can calculate also the score. From the score, you just take the sign, you get the classification, right? And then what you will do to get that W1, W2, 
and B. Oh, you calculate the objective function. What is the objective function? The objective function is what? This one. This is the objective function, right? So W T, okay? W times W basically, okay? And then you have it. So once you can calculate that, you can use solver to solve, right? So once you get this value of W1, W2, and B, then you can predict. So my, my question to you, SVM is eager learning or lazy learning in this case? It's similar to LDA, right? So yeah, this is similar to eager. So this is eager learning, okay? So how do you know eager learning? Because I I only need to know okay, the, re, the output of training is this one, the W1, W2, and B, right? Because once you know W1, W2, and B, you can out, actually calculate the score. From the score, you can calculate the classification, okay? You don't need to train anymore. You, you don't need to use solver anymore. Once you get this W1, W2, and B, you don't need to use solver anymore. The solver part is the training part. Is it clear now? Okay, so now you want to predict, okay? Say, for example, I have X1 and X2 like this. So how are you, how I am going to predict? So then you just put that value, okay? And then, okay, you can get that value and then you calculate the same thing and then you get the score and then you get the classification, okay? <clears throat> so, how about if the classes is not linearly inseparable, uh, okay? So, not linear is a problem in non-linear, right? Yes. So, then similar to uh, linear programming. You remember in linear programming, you have surplus variable, you have slug variable. Remember or not? In OR, OR1, you have passed that course, isn't it? Right? So, then we use this again, okay? So what you will do is you introduce slug variables and then you will use what is called kernel trick. Okay? I'll discuss. So look at this. These are the one that I put as blue in here. These are the points that actually uh, make it not linearly separable, isn't it? <laughs> right? So what you will do? Well, exactly the same thing, okay? But now I need to introduce what is called slack variable, S here, okay? So for each this, I just add a new variable, slack, I name it S, okay? Which is supposed to be larger than one, right? If you look at the optimization here, it's exactly the same as before. Okay, the same thing as this one. Now, because of the introduction of slack variable, then I need to add this constant value. Okay. So, you can, what is this? This constant value uh, on the objective function is basically a cost function, eh? the penalty. Okay. Now, depend that penalty depends on the parameter C okay? that you can choose. Okay. Later today we will practice using uh, Python. Okay. You will see this parameter C is the one that you will input later. Huh? So, uh, what is the precision boundary is not linear, right? Then actually, SPM will produce something like this. Okay. How? SPM produce something like this. I thought the formula is always linear, isn't it? Right? The formula in SPM is always linear. Yes, the SPM formula is always linear. Okay? 
but okay, it used kernel trick inside the program it used what is called kernel trick what is that kernel trick it transform your data okay from non-linear into linear how do you transform that data okay that transform for example earlier this is the actual data which is x1 and x2 right so when you use kernel trick okay inside that program it will create this value and this value so using this kernel trick you will get linear but remember this is in higher dimensional space okay so using this technique later i will discuss okay you don't need to know the mapping function okay okay this is example if you look at this uh example on the left this is in 1d Okay, you have only x, right? If you look at the data, is it linearly separable? No, right? <laughs> so if you use kernel trick, okay, it will increase the dimension. Now you, instead of 1D, it will increase to make it 2D, for example, okay? What is the 2D? Instead of x, it will create x square. Huh? Now if you plot, x and x square now you see we can separate the data linearly can you get the idea or not so by putting your data okay with this non-linear separable into higher dimension okay, then it will become linearly separable so example again okay look at the the left side here this is 2d clearly not linearly separable right because you see the the dot here and the the cross here are bounded by a circle right then using kernel trick okay using kernel trick what we will get we will get a new variable the the old variable is x right x1 x2 right so in the kernel tricks for example in 3d okay then you get three variables with this based on x1 x2 what is that x now we have three bases okay x z1 is x1 square z2 is square root of x1 x2 z3 is actually x2 square then you can separate them linearly amazing okay so again the same thing okay this is another pump and cavity here okay. this is the original uh, data and then if you put it into a uh, higher dimension you can actually separate them okay you can actually separate them uh, if you Put it into higher dimension so okay what is kernel anyway okay so you can you want to do a kernel trick right so then you can uh, define any kernel okay so i can define polynomial kernel i can define radial basis kernel or you can define a neural network kernel it's up to you to define the kernel okay that is the one that you will input in the program. What kernel you will use? Okay, these are example of kernel. So, for example, I use polynomial here. Okay, so this is the kernel of polynomial, right? If I said, oh, I will use radial basis function, this is the kernel that I will use. This is basically like normal distribution, isn't it? Okay, if I use the neural network kernel, so I will use this function. Okay, now. The trans we need to transform the kernel into a mapping function yeah so we we call this a square root of its kernel so 
say you have the kernel, we have a mapping function. It is phi here. Okay. So that means the kernel itself is a multiplication of the a mapping function. Okay, let's take example, okay? Say I have a data, 1D, okay, which is only X, right? So I want to use polynomial kernel degree 2. So this is the degree, yeah? H in here. So polynomial kernel is 1 plus X accent times X. So I have that one. So degree 2, so I put that, okay? So that means what? So if I use polynomial kernel degree 2, then, then I can put this inside here. Okay, The meaning is this one, right? This is in scalar. This is in vector. This is in scalar. So you put it out. Okay? If you put it out, become like this, right? This is just quadratic. They square it all. And then you know this kernel is equal to... Uh, multiplication of two mapping functions so the question is what is the mapping function the mapping function is this one yeah so how do you get that you see yeah? uh, one you see here this one is square root of yeah this is the square root of this right the square root of x and two and then this one is x squared is it clear or not Earlier I said, oh, you can you can do this by, by kernel trick by finding these spaces. So how do you find these spaces? So this is what I explained now. Can you craft it or do you have any question? What do you use what do you use SVM? Do we use it when we have I mentioned. Uh, why do you use SPM? That's a good question, right? Or so, when, yeah. when, when, do when do you use So, uh, your data is binary. Okay. Okay. And uh, your data is either linear separable or nonlinear separable. Okay. Then you can use SPM as one of the alternative. And of course, the data must be uh, continuous. In SPM, the data is continuous value, value right? The X is continuous value. Uh, SPM, you don't use for data that is categorical, for the X. The Y is categorical because it's classification, but the X Okay, the input must be uh, numerical. Okay. And if you compare SVM, for example, with naive base or with uh, other method, okay, if your data is actually linearly separable, of course, SVM will produce much better than naive base. Right? This one have less assumption. Mathematically very strong. You see? Okay. The theory behind SVM is very, very strong. That's why this is one of the one of the best methods. Eh? So this is another example. So suppose you have this data. Okay. You have this data. This is the X, uh, one to nine. The y is just positive and negative, right? Remember, it's binary. Then we use mapping function. Okay, this is the mapping function. Okay, so using this mapping, how do you get this mapping function? We already explained uh, this one. Uh. So if you use one dimension, you get like that. If you use uh, uh, three dimension, you can actually compute, okay? Then you will see that they are actually linearly separable. Okay. So this one I use Excel. Right. You can uh, get the 
x times square root of 2 and then x square here. This is the example. Uh, sir. Yes, sir. What if uh, the function, uh, if the function is already in the form of 3D or 4D, but it's still linearly inseparable, do we? Uh, yeah, you increase. Then you need to increase. Yeah. Increase. It, it, so, it is not it not uh, linear separable yet, right? Okay. Then you increase again. <laughs> so the technique is to increase the, the into higher dimension. Okay. Important here is you understand what is the meaning of this, right? Uh -huh. When you try in the data set later, when you use the program, you already know. Okay. If you don't know what is inside. What you are trying, you don't know, right? But when you know what is inside, oh, this is actually just kernel trick, right? So it's not enough, then you, you increase the uh, dimension. So it's not possible if the solution is the way around. Like uh, if we decrease it like into 2D or what, one dimension, we can find the answer. <laughs> It's not no, like no, that. it's the other way around. That, that okay. one is the, the idea of PCA, right? You reduce it, right? Okay. In, in SVM, is the other way around. That's why I want to explain this because this is like, I want you to, broad, to broaden your idea, okay? Otherwise, you will see, oh, I only know PCA. We need always to reduce, <laughs> right? No, okay. not always, okay? We can also increase. So example PC uh, SPM, then you will understand. Oh yeah, okay, I, I got that idea. So just get the idea first. Okay. You are. Okay. So yeah, this is an example here. Suppose you have two input and you use polynomial kernel degree two. So you put it inside. Okay. So you remember uh, polynomial degree two. So you put it into scalar, right? And then, because this is still square, you put it inside again, so you will get this one. So, if you have 2D, you put into that polynomial degree 2, you actually have six dimension. You see, yeah? we get the square root of this, right? This is 1, square root of 2, right? This is x1, x1. So, this one is square root of 2 of this. This one is, you, you take the square root of this, you get uh, x1, uh, and then you get the square root of this, you get x2, and then you get the square root of this, you get x1, x2, square root of 2. Yeah? So you get six dimension here. It's not necessarily if you, uh, say you, you simply increase the dimension of this kernel. The same kernel you just increase for example instead of two you increase to three suddenly it's no longer just for example from one to two is no longer just multiplied by two right here you see it now becomes six dimension okay so again uh, oh, so i i have a different kernel here i use power kernel so I, I use power kernel, how many dimensions do I have? Or oh, I have only, if I use power kernel, I will get the mapping function of 3D instead of 60. Okay, so this is, I'm talking about how you get the kernel. Uh, how do you get the mapping function from the kernel? Okay, so in practice, in reality, the one that we use in the program is not the one that I show a while ago. Yeah? They use the dual. Remember in, in, in uh, linear programming, you have primal and dual. Okay? So in practice, what they use is the dual yeah? using this value. <clears throat> okay, so the question is, how do you use the uh, kernel in SPM, yeah? you, you, you remember, <coughs> this is the one that we actually use, All right? So this is the actual value, and then we map that to the kernel. Yeah? 
So inside you have a, a V multiplied by V and then you can get the kernel. Okay. So you will see that the, now the value now depending on the kernel itself. Okay. So uh, using that dual why we use to a dual yeah because if you use the dual you can overcome the curse of dimensionality yeah? if you use the primer formula you will sum over all the features okay that means you will have uh, what is called curse of dimensionality because if you have a many many features okay you will have a problem okay? in computation but if you use the dual you only sum over the number of support vector. Okay. This support vector is the alpha here. Okay. So that's why this is a much lesser computation. Okay. So it computational wise. <coughs> okay, so with this I have already explained everything. I guess this is just the same as before. Okay. Hmm. So this is in, in if you use the uh, in Python. Okay, uh, I will go to the Python. You go to in Google Classroom. There is uh, I just posted there SVM in Python. Okay, so this is my tutorial in my website. I'm grateful I do. So I explain everything, the one that we just uh, discussed a while ago. Okay. So this is a laboratory session. So you can you can create your own data. That's fine. Okay. So and how you will train SVM using your data? How you measure the performance? How do you predict? Right. And to understand the role of the kernel and the cost parameter we just discussed a while ago. And what is the meaning of support vector and how to identify the uh, overfitting. Okay. So all you need to do to practice is just to copy and paste. Okay. To copy and paste this. Uh, uh, the data, you can create your own data. And then you open. You have a... Anaconda, right? If you have Anaconda and you can open Jupyter there, okay, and then you copy and paste uh, in Jupyter. Okay. Uh, if you use the same data set, you will get exactly the same. Okay. So this is example of my data set. Either you type it or you, you can just, uh, huh. you can create your own. Okay, so this is my data set. I have only six or seven data and two variables, x1, x2, and y. The y, remember, this is binary, so one and minus one. Okay, so first what you will do, you separate, right? For each training data, you separate them. Right? Okay, and then you give them target name. Okay, and then now you, you uh, plot, now you can plot them. When you plot them, you will see this is actually uh, linearly separable. Okay. And then to do a training, okay, we use uh, scikit-learn, right? So this is the scikit-learn. Okay, sklearn import fpm. This is the, the import. And then this is to get the matrix later. Huh? <clears throat> Can you see this? Oh, sir, it's not showing. Not showing. Okay. Can you see it now? Yes. Okay. Uh, you can also go to that website. In the website. Right? So this is the SK Learn that you will import. You just import SPM, and then this is the matrix. So this is the data you can type or you can create your own. Okay. So I separate the X data and the Y you see here. Okay. 
Okay. All you need to do is just copy and paste. Okay. And this is to plot. So PLT here is to plot. All right. And then this is the training. So I call this SPC. So this is vector support classification. So you already have the X training and Y training. So let's say you have a so for training you need to specify the kernel. You see that? Okay. Of course, inside you have uh, already certain degree, for example, for the kernel. Okay. You can change if you want. So the kernel is linear kernel in this case. Okay, so you can get the parameter inside that. And then uh, you can get the decision function. So this is to set the boundary of the plot and then you can uh, separate them so I, I, I show here okay, that they are actually linearly separable All right after that what now I want to show the, the margin and the support so this if you copy and paste this uh, plot is basically to show this is the, the margin and this is the support Okay, then you can check oh, which one is the support. Okay, so you just put SPC and support. Okay. So after that, you can get the support vector. This is the support vector. Okay, and after that, you check the accuracy, right? Similar to Weka. Right? So you do a accuracy. Okay, you get the score that is the based on that. Now you can predict. Okay, say I predict what is your x here, and then I can get the prediction. Okay. You can also uh, check the score accuracy <clears throat> and the confusion matrix. You can also check. Okay. Uh, if you want, you can also visualize that confusion matrix. This is optional. So suppose you have new data, okay, which is uh, three and six. Then you want to predict. So this is the result one. One is positive, right? Minus one is negative. Uh, remember, in SVM, the the output is binary. Okay, either one or minus one. Okay, so oh, if your data is non-linear separable, so I give this data. Again, you can copy and you can also <coughs> create your own data. Okay, and the same thing. Now I use uh, the same thing. You can train also the same thing. Okay. And you see that this is not uh, linearly non separable okay. And now I can change the, the uh, fitting. Okay. This is the cost. Okay. To improve that for non linearly uh, separable, so you increase the cost. Okay. This one is the increase the cost. Can you see it? And then I got the accuracy. Accuracy in here is say 94%. Okay. I can also train using a different kernel. Okay. For example, I use polynomial kernel. What is the degree? You can also put the degree and then this is the cost. You can also put the cost. Remember, uh, the cost you know the, the, the equation a while ago in the slide, right? So you, you understand the meaning of it. Okay, so now if you use polynomial kernel, you will see this is the, the support vector. Okay, and of course, uh, because you, you increase the kernel uh, degree, okay, you get 100% accuracy. Okay. But uh, the question is, this is okay. Huh? Now, let's try to get the rough idea of overfitting okay? instead of polynomial i use rbf 
Okay. And then I set the gamma is 3. Ah, you will see here. Okay. Gamma is 1, for example, you see. This is, the result is clearly, not, clearly non-linear. Okay. And 100% correct. Okay. But from here, you will see that actually this is overfit, isn't it? The, the separation is no longer just linear, simple, like this. Okay. But uh, now it's inside, something inside, something else. Right? Yes, sir. So you can see from the plot, yeah, this is actually overfitting. Of course, the, the, the accuracy is 100%. Okay. Again, you can try the, that one dimensional data that I put in the slide okay. and you can train exactly the same thing and you can also use RBF to, to plot. Huh? So try this uh, either today or at home so that you can get the idea okay, how to use SPM in Python. This one in Python. This one. So you have learned how to use Weka, you have learned how to use uh, uh, Python to program. Okay. Uh, say you said, oh, I, I want to use scikit-learn, but I don't want SPM. I want naive base. Can. Okay. You just search in Google, what is scikit-learn for, uh, for naive base. Okay. Exactly the same technique. You just separate the training data okay, and, and so on. Okay. So, so tell me what did you learn today and then uh, give me feedback am i too fast or not i don't know how oh, we learn about svm a binary classification for increasing the dimensionality of data set instead of reducing it like TCA. Yes. So and how about naive base? Uh, naive base uses probability, right? Right. That, that probability you assume independent. Okay. Uh, yes. I'll give you assignment okay for the naive base. Is it okay? That that the text recognition a while ago. Oh sure. So that you can just use Excel, it's okay. If you don't want to use Excel, you want to code it, that's okay also. Huh? So that you sure. you know, oh, I can do text classification, not just a data table, right? Okay. That is uh, something that valuable for you. I, I want you to be confident that after this class, okay, you know what to do if you face an, any problem. Okay. So last time we learned image, this time we learned text. Okay. So I hope uh, with this uh, you can uh, improve. Okay. So next week, again, eh, we will have a quiz in the beginning of the class. It will start uh, 1125. It will close uh, 1140. So if you are late, you will not be able to take the quiz. Okay. Yeah, I want to make a discipline that you, you come early in the class. And uh, second, uh, I'll give you assignment. Okay. And then the third one is you will present your group project next week. So please submit your uh, presentation in Google Classroom one day before the, the class presentations sir. yeah or yeah powerpoint oh okay just the powerpoint right or should we like show the progress or the yeah the, the powerpoint of the progress uh okay. when you demo you 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 can demo it no problem but uh, uh i want you to have a proof that you you prepare okay i don't want you come to the class oh i will still prepare that is not okay. Yeah, I know. I know. Yeah. So yeah. 
you prepare before the class so that uh, during the class you are already prepared. That's the point there. That's okay. Why I asked you. So, sure. Say yeah. you don't want PowerPoint, you you just create a uh, a website or something. That's fine. You just put the link. That's, you don't need to create a PowerPoint. That's okay. 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 As long as you have a proof that yeah. you you will present something. Okay. Yeah. Okay, so just two minutes. You you have a uh, any more question? So next week we will discuss neural network. Did you learn neural network in other class? My question first. No, never. Okay, okay. I will discuss neural network. Okay. Uh, hmm. Neural network is the, of course, we will just use a simple neural network in binary, okay? Uh, but at the same time, you can improve that. There are many neural networks, but I'll just give you the basic, so that at least you get the idea first. Okay? After that, you, you can learn by yourself. Okay? The important part in this class is not to give you everything, right? It's impossible anyway. The important part is to give you the basics so that you are ready to learn on your own. That you can read. Right? Mm -hmm. And that's the question, uh, that's the purpose of education. Anyway. Thank you for today. So, see you next week. Thank you, sir. Thank you, sir. Thank you, sir. Uh, guys.